The dour mood of the prison yard was oppressive to my senses. Agony, despair, hunger, and fear, all overlapping and boiling together in the hot, humid air. Yet amongst the sea of negative emotions, there was a taste of hope, a drop of defiance, all of it coming from the 16 lone humans who sat in a corner of the yard by themselves. Humans were not like the Matanaxi. Their long, sturdy limbs and hairless skin made them appear almost diseased compared to our frail, furry, hunched physique. The humans softly joked and passed a lit cigarette around their circle, occasionally throwing glances at the heavily armed crustacean-like Tyranians that patrolled the catwalks above the courtyard fences. Truth be told, I felt bad for the humans. They were our allies, yes, but they didn't belong here. Even now I could feel it radiating off them. Want, longing, regret, and fear soaked into their bravado like urine into a bedsheet. I found myself mirroring their actions, glancing around at this odd base we'd been imprisoned at. It was strange in more ways than one, this place they kept us. The central courtyard held prisoners, yes, but we never left the central yard. Everywhere else was squat barracks, vehicle yards, a command center, even a small shuttle port that they received supplies from every seventh day. Anti-air batteries bristled from the roofs of every building, manned 27 hours a day, eight days a week. Every now and then I'd spotted Tyranians in starry suits, entering and exiting a building that they often dragged the Matanaxi prisoners into. They never returned as far as I could tell. It was haunting, you'd feel their terror, their despair as they were dragged between those tall double doors before it would disappear the moment those doors swung closed. Thinking about those doors made me shudder as I instinctually drew closer to the humans, finally overhearing snippets of the stories they swapped around. They talked of friends made, of comrades in arms lost to the Terranians, of a time they rescued a downed pilot who they joked followed them on every deployment after they'd gotten the air again. They laughed at their past complaints of mess hall food when comparing it to the ground up invertebrates we were fed by the Tyranians. They lobbed what I could only assume were insults in their native tongue at the expressionless Tyranian guards. One of the guards stared at the humans before making a show of switching his turbo plast rifle to maim instead of kill. Suddenly, the sharp crackling roll of thunder split the clear midday air. It had come from the west, from friendly lines if my internal compass was correct. Along with confusion, the sound brought with it an emotion, faint and fleeting, but an emotion all Manataxi could feel. It shook me to my core. It was only an echo, but it was potent and only growing stronger, anger. I found myself looking to the sky, a low rumble still building in the air, growing louder and louder as Tyranians shouted and sounded a blaring klaxon. The humans, however, had gone stock still, staring at the sky same as me, but the only emotion flooding off them was disbelief and hope. Like a drink of cool water, hope leaked from each human, like the trickle of a placid stream, the rumble growing louder, eclipsed by the klaxon, but still there getting ever more louder as anti-air missile and gun batteries swiveled towards the noise. The klaxon quickly became a blaring undertone as that unending roar began to rattle in my chest, one of the humans slowly standing as their hopeful whisper reached my ears louder than even the roar from above. No fucking way is that crash. No, no, there's no way they'd authorize a solo mission for us unless... Crack! A red blur flashed over the jungle treetops. The sonic boom trailing behind it rattled my teeth in my skull and nearly pushed me to my back as I caught a glimpse of aggressively swept back wings and a teardrop-shaped fuselage. That feeling of anger overwhelming even the strongest of despair as its very existence seemed to want to rip this camp asunder. The red blur pitched up, soaring straight up into the sky while remaining in view from the courtyard. The humans had all stood, shouting and hollering before one bellowed out. Crash, you crazy son of a bitch. I was confused. Were they really calling for this supposed ally to crash? The fondness coming off of them seemed quite contrarian. Oh, I remembered they'd been talking about a downed pilot they'd rescued. One that apparently followed them wherever they deployed. The scream of AA missiles launching shook me from my reverie as I watched a half dozen round-nosed missiles streak into the sky after the red blur. The missiles screamed as they honed in on the red blur, the blur doing a sharp roll before rocketing towards the ground, missiles hot on its tail.
The blur disappeared beyond the canopy that rose over the tops of the buildings as visual cover, very ineffective visual cover apparently. The sounds of many rapid sequential detonations echoed through the jungle, the roar never dying as it again grew louder. It flashed overhead and I caught another glimpse of this strange machine. Two hulking, roaring engines sat on either side of its vertical stabilizer, spitting an intense, conical blue flame. Boom! I was thrown head over heels by the shockwave, as what must have been at least a hundred pound bomb detonated inside a barracks building somewhere in the base. The steady roar of AA plasma guns as they fired magnetically condensed beams of plasma into the sky hundreds of yards behind the red blur's tail were interspersed by the scream of missiles streaking after the blur. The blur zoomed up into the sky again, missiles screeching after it on a mission to clip its tail feathers. The blur suddenly just stopped midair, the missiles screeching around it and detonating just beyond its nose. Large metal flap and sticking 90 degrees up from just about every flat surface on the sleek machine. By the divines, was it a beautiful machine? Painted red as blood, flat teardrop-shaped fuselage, flanked on either side by wings that swept back so aggressively they almost touched the wide empennage. Another vertical stabilizer extended down from the one between the now silent engines. The cockpit wasn't the normal bubble-like affair that human hovercraft were fond of. It didn't stick up from the body of the aircraft. Instead, it was set into the surface so it would produce next to no additional drag from what I understood. The aircraft slowly rolled in place, revealing a massive rotary cannon just beneath the nose and a belly laden with bombs. The aircraft pitched backwards, engines igniting with a loud thrum as it fell into a controlled dive. Rotary cannon pointed straight at the base as beams of plasma swept around it ineffectually. For a moment, I found myself staring into that cockpit, and for a split second, I closed my eyes and peeked into the emotional mind of the man inside. Anger, indignation, indebtment, exhilaration, conviction. <laughs> the roar of the massive rotary cannon quickly followed the deafening crackle of hundreds, if not thousands, of explosive rounds ripped a command center in two. The aircraft quickly picked up speed, buzzing the courtyard yet again as the humans began to shout and holler with excitement and hope. Our guards had long since scrambled away to man the anti-air batteries against this utter madman of a pilot. The ground shook as the plane pitched upwards again. One bomb lighter as yet another barracks was reduced to rubble. The plane had returned to being little more than a blur, dozens of missiles streaking after it as it rocketed into the sky in a lazy loop. The missiles were so close to hitting the plane as it flew in wide, rapid circles, outpacing the missiles and letting them explode just behind their tail. It grew more intense as more and more missiles arced into the sky chasing after the plane and its ballsy pilot. However, I wasn't sure if that distinction could be made. The aircraft moved like its own graceful beast, dodging beams of superheated plasma like slalom poles, while at the same time dodging missiles like they were thrown stones. Barracks buildings and vehicle depots going up in flame and shockwave each time it passed over the base, its mighty cannon roaring like a beast of legend as it ripped even the strongest buildings apart, missiles streaking after it like angry insects. The plane pulled up, intending to gain altitude, when a missile broke away from the cluster, accelerating to almost twice its speed as it splashed against the streamlined cockpit in a puff of black smoke. The plane continued to gain altitude as the missiles behind it hit their safety range and detonated. Its engine's marvelous blue flame turning oily and orange as it quickly lost speed for its ascent, the hopeful mood was doused as we all watched the plane begin to tumble back toward the ground, cockpit shattered and smoking. A great deal of despair came from the once ecstatic humans as they watched their comrade start tumbling down to earth. I couldn't believe it. Such a talented, skilled pilot laid low by a lucky lock. I stared hopelessly at the broken cockpit, desperately trying to connect to the emotional mind of the pilot, hoping it might just wake the... Smoke, blaring warnings, whistling wind and pain. So, so much pain. Hands slack on the controls the pilot slowly came to, chest cold with terror. Then, those limp hands suddenly clenched around the controls, a hand missing a finger gripping the control stick as a burnt one clutched the throttle, slamming it forwards as red-tinted vision 
switched to the thermal and infrared imaging of electronic sensors. A fire burnt in the pilot's chest as they wrestled the machine into a level flight. Cockpit speakers screaming over the rushing wind low altitude as they grit bloody teeth and pulled up as hard as they could, skimming the treetops. Krakum! The plane ripped the air in two as it flew overhead, trailing smoke as its mighty engines gave their dragons roar of defiance. The mighty metal beast spitting destruction as two nearby barracks buildings went up in smoke and shockwaves, the plane pitching up and rolling back to flat as its rotary cannon breathed explosive fire onto the building they'd been taking Matanaxi into. The building cracking and ripping apart as the AA batteries on top sympathetically detonated or got thrown off. An AA plasma beam gun crushed a section of the courtyard fencing, freeing us. But none dared leave the courtyard under the watchful eye of the metal beast above. With no more AAA to even attempt to threaten it, the beast laid waste to the Tyranian base, the shuttle port being the last to go up in flames as several bombs fell directly on top of it, swiftly followed by a short burst of cannon fire. Tyranians sprinted off into the jungle, making guttural vocalizations of pure terror as the metal beast gave chase. The sound of its mighty cannon ripping through the air in short bursts for almost a minute while it was out of view. The next we saw of it, it was flying at a half speed overhead. One engine flamed out and spewing smoke as it flew towards friendly lines. The human soldiers didn't miss a beat as they jumped to their feet, running out of the courtyard after their friend as a loud crash was heard in the distance. I'm not ashamed to say that I was sprinting after them. It was well into the next morning when we finally came upon the crash site. It was oddly serene, a massive divot in the ground strewn with wreckage, leading up to what almost looked like a heavily bandaged corpse leaning against the crumpled fuselage of their aircraft. Their circulator mask unhooked from the ports in their face as they calmly smoked a cigarette with a four-fingered hand. An AI core was clutched in their burnt hand, softly pulsing red as they slowly turned their head to look at us and grin. Their face was covered in dried blood, tawny hair matted with the congealing crimson liquid. We all stared at each other for a long moment before one of the humans softly asked, You good crash? Anything broken? as they stepped forward and knelt by the pilot's side. The pilot just cockily laughed and nodded at his leg, hastily splinted with bits of metal from the crash. Yeah, but I fixed it for you, Doc. Good to see my grunts made it out alive after that shit show. The human just laughed and sat down beside the pilot, who continued to chuckle softly before saying, I'm totally getting court-martialed for this, but it's worth it. Another human looked at the pilot quizzically before sitting down and producing a cigarette from the pocket of their uniform. Why's that crash? The pilot smirked and took a long drag off the cigarette before laughing nonchalantly. Well, I wasn't authorized for this flight mission, so I technically stole a several billion credit piece of equipment and hundreds of thousands worth in ordnance before flying at 200 miles behind enemy lines, bombing the shit out of a base we weren't supposed to find, and then crashing it, a la my call sign. Totally fucking worth it for you guys, though. Crash laughed raucously, the humans chuckling along with him. I found myself approaching the pilot before I could stop myself. I threw myself into a bow, feeling the pilot's carefree attitude like an ocean of peace in my fear-addled brain. On behalf of me and my people, thank you. You saved many of us this day. We are grateful. I felt the pilot's eyes swivel onto me and a spark of fondness in their heart as they calmly patted my shoulder. No need to bow your head, little red panda guy. I distinctly remember someone infiltrating my mind when I was about to crash and burn, snapped me awake enough to finish the attack. I looked up, awestruck. I had woken him up. Crash just nodded and took another drag off his cigarette, before beckoning a couple of the other humans over to help him stand. Anyway, let's get walking, yuh. I'm gonna smell like a corpse by the time we get out of here. I quickly scrambled to my feet, falling in line with the humans, as we began the march towards friendly lines. Along the way, I asked for the story behind Crash's willingness to strategically transfer equipment to an alternate location, and his apparent penchant for it. The humans and Crash himself were happy to fill me in. They'd all been deployed to the same sector of a desert planet. Crash was their unit's designated air support. During one especially intense mission, Crash had gotten his plane shot down and crashed behind enemy lines. The human grunts, as they called themselves, had seen this. And knowing Crash wouldn't have abandoned them, they defied orders and infiltrated enemy lines to go looking for him. They'd found him passed out beneath a crumpled wing of his wrecked aircraft, pulsing red AI core clutched to the chest of the half-dead human. 
They then proceeded to carry Crash the 40 or so miles back to the FOB on foot. They were reprimanded and court-martialed for insubordination, would have been dishonorably discharged too if they hadn't also managed to recover the plane's black box and bring it back, preventing sensitive operation data from falling into enemy hands. I found myself not speaking much after that in awe of these humans who'd risked everything for a friend and a friend who'd risked everything for them. The B-5298 screamed through the snowy night skies, flying low and alone above treetops and scrubland, deep in Tyranian territory. The fat, dark plane had a red floodlight affixed to the nose. Smeary, bright red letters on the side read out in galactic standard as Rudolph. To anyone listening over the radio, the plane was dead silent. In the cockpit, a lone pilot with a conical, floppy red and white hat with a puffball at the end taped to the top of his helmet, pulled a straw from the drinking port in his circulator mask. Setting down the packet on the dash, text was visible labeling it as Special Ration 1225, Eggnog Beverage with Nutmeg. The sound of loud, slightly drunk singing was coming from the cargo bay as Crash kept the plane level with a soft smile. Keying into the closed circuit comms, he could hear the song his grunts were singing. A dozen or so deep, gravelly, and merry voices happily, if poorly, sang an old Christmas carol. Dashing through the snow, in the one-horse open sleigh, over the hills we go, laughing all the way. Crash chuckled softly and checked his instruments, flying blind through the snow. A muted warning flashed in the corner of his visor, telling him to turn back to friendly lines immediately. Naturally, he'd been ignoring it for a good hour or so now. After all, it was Christmas Eve, and he was on a mission courtesy of old St. Nick himself. He'd strategically transferred a crate's worth of dehydrated hams, freeze-dried turkey, canned green bean casserole, potato flakes for mashed potatoes, au gratin mix, and freeze-dried potato slices. And of course, he hadn't forgotten more than two dozen different home-baked pies that his husband and the community back home had shipped over with the last resupply ship. Now he probably could have gotten away with stealing a smaller plane, if that was all he had to deliver. However, this shipment was for the men and women who'd been holding the Cleft Valley Fortress after the Tyranians had captured the area around it. Alongside the crates of food and drink were pallets and pallets of power cells, kinetic munitions, parts, artillery shells, a brand new Bradley D-60 IFV, and several small artillery pieces. He grabbed his packet of eggnog and poked the straw through his circulator taking a long draw from the packet and swirling it around his mouth before swallowing noisily. It always felt strange drinking with a circulator on, considering that all the veins, arteries, and blood vessels in his neck had to be closed off for the circulator to work. It made swallowing stiff and awkward, but he'd deal with it for that sweet, sweet eggnog. Crash hummed to the tune of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. As he pitched the plane up, to cruise over a small mountain in their flight path. Checking his instruments again, he began to hear a soft, feminine voice inside his head also pick up the tune. Hey, Charlie, how's our fuel looking? The friendly voice of his AI, Charlemagne, quickly responded back. Fuel is at an even 70% crash. Point defense turrets are also running under optimal conditions. Crash nodded and held up the packet of eggnog as he steered the plane with one four-fingered hand. Want some? You should be able to celebrate with us too, you know? Not like you went rogue to be treated like a sub-sapient AI. There was a tinkling laugh in his head and his mouth went numb. Thank you, Charlie responded as he poked the straw through his circulator again, drawing a mouthful and swishing it around. His visor went a little fuzzy for a moment as he sensed a deep satisfaction from the rogue AI. When his taste came back, he quickly swallowed the eggnog as Charlie hummed. Ooh, that's good. I'm always amazed at the depth of flavor humanity can taste in a single item. Crash chuckled about to respond when he felt Charlie immediately go into her combat readiness protocol. Milliseconds before the warning popped up in his helmet and shrieked in his ears. Warning, warning, incoming hostiles, evasive maneuvers recommended. Chucking the packet of eggnog into the co-pilot seat, Crash shouted, lock me in, Charlie, how many are there? There was a split second as his vision distorted before becoming a hectic mix of data and shattered imagery before it solidified into a display like a bank of monitors in his head able to switch between thermals, infrared, EMF detection, and of course, his normal vision. Charlie was quick to reply. There are four Terranian interceptors and one craft of unknown origin quickly gaining on us. Crash cursed before accessing the closed circuit comms channel and commanding. 
All right, fellas, hold on to something. It's about to get bumpy. A flurry of confirmations was all he needed before immediately pulling up into a near vertical ascension, the aircraft groaning from the strain as the altimeter rapidly shot up. Able to see his instruments without moving his head, he leveled out at around 50,000 feet, the engines sucking in the cold air and getting a 40% power boost as drag was significantly reduced by the thinner air. Flying above the clouds, he watched his instruments as four blips screamed towards him. The fifth, nowhere to be seen. He cranked the throttle forward, barely giving himself space as he ordered Charlie to fire up the point defense systems. No sooner had he given the order than a missile warning blared in the cockpit. On it! Charlie's voice shouted in his head as he pitched the nose down again, hearing a short sequence of detonations behind him. Cursing loudly, he watched one of the interceptors break off and accelerate toward him in a dive, rapidly gaining on the big, ugly, fat fuck of a plane he was flying. Watching his altimeter, he yanked back on the throttle and the stick as soon as they reached 5,000 feet, pulling out of the dive just in time to hear treetops smacking the underside of the fuselage. But he hadn't thrown the interceptor just yet as it quickly pulled up after him, another missile lock warning screaming in his ears as he did an impromptu barrel roll. The B-5298 groaned in protest as the missile streaked by, rattling the airframe with its shockwave as it detonated just in front of the nose. Crash flew through the puff of black smoke as Charlie reported, engaging enemy with point defense systems in 3-2 what? The surprise in her voice surprised him as he checked the radar and saw that the blip had disappeared. What happened? He shouted in a little panic of his own. Charlie's response was laden with disbelief. The fifth aircraft rammed into it. Check the rear thermal. He shouted in both disbelief and panic. Charlie was silent, clearly in just as much disbelief as he was. Is, is that fucking Santa Claus? What kind of drugs were in that eggnog? He watched Father Christmas wave and then blur out of existence as another screeching missile warning had him cursing and rolling to the side as Charlie lays the missile out of the sky. Crash saw another blip on the radar go dark, then another, and then the last. Crash kept the plane steady, listening for missile or hostile warnings, but receiving none. Then his radio crackled and a voice that sounded like it was coming from an early 21st century microphone buzzed through the radio. It was an old but kindly voice, and the wind whipped in the background. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas to you, Clark. I'm a busy man, so I hope you'll forgive me for leaving so soon. I left your gift beneath your bed. The radio fuzzed out and Crash just stared blankly ahead for a long moment, softly muttering. I'm high. I'm stoned. I must be on something, unless you heard that too? Charlie remained silent, a feeling of apprehension coming from her. Crash sighed. I wasn't hallucinating, was I? Well, shit. Then I forgot to leave out some cookies and milk. Charlie laughed nervously as Crash checked their coordinates. His eyes widened as he realized they were almost to their destination. Charlie, radio ahead and let them know we're coming in for a landing. You know, where, oh, uh, I need a drink. There was a silent confirmation from Charlie as Crash slowly began to pitch the nose down and ease up on the throttle. Keying the closed circuit comms, he asked. Everyone all right back there? He heard Johnny respond first. I'm fine getting a lot more intimate with a crate of ham than I'd like, but I'm fine. The others quickly replied, many in similar situations. Crash breathed a sigh of relief, seeing the soft blue glow of a terrestrial dome shield below through the snow. As he got closer, an opening in the shield yawned wide and he flew through, bringing the B-52 in for a gentle landing. Having extricated himself from the neural dance with the Charlie, Crash was helping unload the crates when Clyde got his attention. Hey Crash, were these here when we took off? Crash passed off one of the mini crates of ammo to Johnny before weaving through the crates on his way over. Clyde stood by a small pyramid of four crates, scratching his head. Each one of the boxes had a sleigh with reindeer pulling it and a large man and bag inside in black silhouette, block numbers above reading. Kringle's gifts and trinkets, please deliver. Jamming the end of a pry bar beneath the lid of one of the ancient-looking wooden crates, he leveraged the top off with the squeal of pulled nails. He was a little surprised to see the top box, filled with neatly wrapped presents, all from Santa. Gently setting the box lid to the side, he made sure his Santa hat was still on before grabbing a few of the square packages and stacking them in his arms, telling Clyde a little white lie in the process. Must have been, let's get them delivered. It is Christmas after all, let's spread some more cheer. I'll have the others start. A piercing tone in his ear was followed by his commander's exasperated voice. Crash, nobody is saying anything, so I have to ask you, did you steal a B-5298 and a bunch of food and ammo? 
Crash paused before smirking and sarcastically replying, No, I would need to veer! There was a defeated sigh from the other end, and his commander asked no more questions. Crash smiled as he turned and carried the gifts down the ramp, calling out, Is there a Billy, Andy, Moira, Michael, and Alexander McNamara here? We got presents. Crash lay in his bunk, the other pilots snoring and snuffling in their sleep, the only sound. He found he couldn't sleep. He'd had a chance to hollow room a visit with Paul, but the truth was, he was homesick. In his bunk closest to the window, he looked at the open locket in his hand with the help of the triplet full moon's light. On the right side was a photo of him and Paul on their wedding day, perhaps the happiest day of Crash's life. On the left was a photo of him holding Charlemagne's freshly issued AI core up to a bottle of bourbon like it was taking a sip. Back when she still glowed steady green instead of the flashing red of a rogue AI. With a deep sigh, Crash closed the locket and stared out across the small neon green grass of the training field. The three large full moons shone their delicate light from over the concertina wire and through the soft blue of the dome shield. It really was a beautiful planet they were fighting for. The few times he'd met the locals, a psychic, empathic, red panda type people, they were amazingly kind and accommodating to the strange creature who'd crashed a metal bird into one of their fields. Boy, was that one hell of a chewing out when he got back to base. Sighing, Crash swung his legs off the thin mattress. Still in his flight suit, though, he had loosened the straps for comfort. Retightening them, he stood, stretched, and snagged his helmet from his nightstand. Technically, he was supposed to keep it in his locker, but nobody dared to steal his beat-up, outdated, bulky gray helmet. Holding it under one arm, he quietly crept past the other sleeping pilots and slipped out the bunkroom door and into the common area. They'd been stationed here for a while, almost three of the local years, roughly a month longer than the ones back on Earth. The common room had couches, gaming consoles, view screens, and even a small bar set up in the corner. Crash admittedly wasn't fond of the many nude pinup posters on the walls and even the ceiling, but he couldn't judge the others for also getting a little homesick. Stopping by the circulator recharger station, he checked the small red mini fridge to make sure they had plenty of O negative to last the day, counting 40 of the sterile glass cylinders in their specialized racks. He pressed the small button on the side of the fridge to put in a restock request and pulled one of the two pint cylinders from its rack. Slotting it into the side of the recharger, he pulled his issued circulator box from the cleaning rack. Inserting it into the slot on the recharger, he hit the charge button and watched as it slowly faded from red to green. Pulling his circulator loose, he hooked it onto his flight suit belt and hooked his helmet's circulator mask into it. With a soft smile, he slid his helmet on and flicked the visor down, tapping the emergency radio button four times. The sound of the helmet's inbuilt speakers crackling to life with a very groggy-sounding Charlemagne made him chuckle softly. Sleep well? How's the installation into the new frame going? They're being gentle, right? The AI laughed softly and groaned as if just getting out of bed. They're being gentle crash, don't worry. This new frame feels nice. It's got 40 more petabytes of pure RAM than the instigator. Not to mention the CPU. I'm directly hooked in. No wires or anything. And it's made by Texas Instruments. We're going to be the scariest thing to fly since the F-22. Crash chuckled and let the door slide open before walking out into the training yard. Making his way past the infantry barracks, he took the long route to the airstrip while talking with Charlemagne. Sounds pretty scary. What's the weapon and engine specs? Is she fast? Charlemagne giggled madly and some numbers popped up in his visor. Crash paused, reading the specs with a slowly growing grin. They upgraded the rotary cannon to, am I reading this right? A 70 millimeter GAU 5000? I didn't realize General Electric was still working on that. Oh my, 100,000 pound hypersonic payload capacity, Charlie. I think they've built a monster. Crash stepped onto the airstrip, glancing around at the four armored hangars they kept the base's supply of fighters in spotting the only one with guards for the personnel door. He began sauntering towards the guarded hangar, making swaggering movements with his hands. This, of course, got the guards' attention. Looked to be two new Lance Corporals, uniforms still a fresh, mottled, bright green. When he was finally within a couple dozen paces, one of the greenies perked up excitedly, and his partner lightly punched him. The grumpy one called out to him. Halt, state your name and purpose. Crash flicked his visor up, glancing at the electronic door lock before answering. Name's Clark Kent Bordelain. Everyone knows me as Crash. Came to take a look at the new plane the Federation brought for me. The grumpy greenie gave a deep sigh. 
realizing the stubborn motherfucker he had to deal with. Do you have your access card? Crash pointed at the personnel door. It's in there. The guard sighed frustratedly, about to respond when the lock beeped and the door slid open. The grumpy guard breathed a surprising sigh of relief and just gestured at the door. Head on in, sir. Please don't report this to anyone. Crash chuckled and mimed zipping his lips and locking them before throwing away the key. He was about to step past the guards when the other, far more excited-looking one, blurted out, Crash, sir, can I get your autograph, please, sir? Crash paused, looking at the young man quizzically. He couldn't have been older than 18 or 19. Eventually, Crash just shook his head and chuckled, holding out a gloved, four-fingered hand. Didn't realize I was famous enough to warrant an autograph, but all right, kid. What do you want me to sign? The young Lance Corporal looked ecstatic and unzipped their uniform jacket before pulling out a crinkled comic book and marker, excitedly gushing. You're the reason I wanted to join up, sir. You're famous back home. The United Planets made a comic about your heroic actions. Did, did you really steal an A-50 and bomb the shit out of a secret Terranian camp? Did you actually see Santa Claus? Can I meet Charlie? Crash was stunned and quickly put his hands out, coming the young man before looking at the comic book in his hand entitled King of the Sky, Hash 10 Crash's Christmas Miracle. For a moment, he couldn't speak before laughing with surprise and signing the cover with a small message of encouragement and his signature. Knowing Charlie was somehow involved in this, he put down her initials in binary and handed the young man back his comic book and marker. Yeah, I stole an A-50 and bombed the shit out of some Terranian secret research lab. They were butchering the poor red panda guys trying to figure out their psychic abilities. They made the mistake of capturing my grunts and not disabling their RFID chips. And yes, I met Santa. He's the one pilot I never want to cross. Anyway, I'm going to go check out that new airframe. Stay frosty, boys. Let me know if something happens while I'm in there. The starry-eyed young man nodded rapidly and quickly pocketed the comic book and marker before snapping a sharp salute. Crash respectfully returned it before slipping into the hangar and letting the door whoosh close behind him. Turning around, he whistled softly. She was a massive beast, all sharp lines and intakeless thrusters. He marveled at the thin, almost knife-like wings and sharp, slim missiles he had to imagine were also experimental, hanging beneath. The nose of the ship had no protruding gun. Instead, the entire front nose cap was bolted directly to the front of the rotary cannon, massive, fist-wide, chrome-lined barrels still fresh from the factory. Walking around to the tail, he noticed the strange white metal cylinder hooked into the fuselage. Hey, Charlie, what are they putting in this thing as fuel? Specs didn't say. Antimatter, Crash's brain shut down for a second as he stared at the waist-high metal cylinder. Don't we use that in our planet crackers? Mm-hmm. The tank holds about 12 planet crackers worth of antimatter. Crash was silent for a moment, then almost whispered, What's the thrust-to-weight ratio I see four engines? Roughly 1,000 pounds of thrust per cubic ounce. That's with maximum payload included. Crash just gazed at the aircraft in awe, flicking his visor down and checking the aircraft's empty weight. His jaw dropped when he saw it was little more than 70,000 pounds. He slowly stepped up to the aircraft and put his hand against the titanite skin, the red paint still tacky from fresh application. Crash just slowly wiped his eyes as he sniffled softly. It's beautiful. Charlie giggled pleasantly as Crash just slowly walked around the aircraft in awe, inspecting the white interior metal of the engines and the apparent lack of moving parts the sleek, deadly-looking missiles hanging from the wings. Crouching under the airframe, he looked at the thin seams where the nuclear-capable bomb bay doors lay flush against the fuselage. Walking out from beneath the aircraft, he clambered onto a wing, and Charlie popped the flush glassless cockpit open to reveal the thickly padded pilot seat and simplified instruments. Sliding into the seat, he took hold of the steering joystick and throttle. They were comfortable, grippy, the seat seeming to want to swallow him whole and not let him move. Crash connected the spinal jack into the port at the base of his skull and cycled through the cameras and sensors, able to zoom in on the concrete and hangar around the aircraft so far that he could see microscopic organisms wiggling around on the duracrete. With a whistle, he feigned pressing the bomb release button before making an explosion noise with his mouth. Touching the cannon trigger with his toes, he made a burt noise with his mouth before giggling softly. He was all too excited to get to test this baby. Slam! Sir, sir, the dome shield is down and comms are dead. Crash's blood ran cold as he whipped his head to look at the terrified young man whose comic he'd autographed. What do you mean the dome shield is down? I didn't hear any attacks. 
The young man wildly gestured toward the sky outside the door. I don't know. It just went dark, and then the young man never got to finish his sentence. Wump! A bomb detonated behind the young Lance Corporal, throwing him into the hangar and against the side of the plane. The armored hangar rattled, alarms beginning to blare, but Crash didn't hear them, unhooking himself from the spinal jack and leaping from the aircraft to rush over to the young man's side. Rolling him over, Crash felt the shoulder bones in the young man's arm had been reduced to powder. The young soldier looked up into Crash's visor, a glimmer of hope in his eyes, blood leaking from his nose and mouth as he laboredly panted. Are, are you going to go get him, Crash? Just, just leave me here. I'll wait. I'll wait for a medic. Crash could barely speak as the young man whipped the blood from his face with the one good hand he had left. The young man then gently palmed the side of Crash's helmet, leaving a bloody palm print. My, my name's Jerry. I just wanted to let you know. The light faded from the young man's eyes and his arm fell away. Crash ripped a glove off with his teeth and felt for a pulse. There was none. Crash knelt there for a moment, beside the young man's body. Then he slowly pulled his circulator mask on, feeling it lock into the ports on his face as he gently dragged Jerry away from the aircraft. He let Jerry rest beside the door as he activated his circulator, blood vessels and arteries in his neck constricting to halt the G-force-induced pulling of blood away from the brain. He unhooked the antimatter nozzle from the fuel tank and closed the flap, letting it lock in place before climbing into the cockpit and jacking in. Charlemagne, open those doors and prepare for synchronization. Crash's blood boiled as he strapped in and manually started the aircraft, following the instructions displayed in his helmet. The massive armored hangar doors sliding open to reveal a star-laden sky, and hundreds of Gnosian and Terranian bomber fighters. Seeing their Gnosian allies already in the fight, Crash began to force the throttle forward, tiny increment by tiny increment as the plane began rolling forward, almost immediately as the canopy closed, surrounding him with a perfect, 360-degree field of view as the exterior cams activated. Curving out onto the runway, Crash slammed the throttle forward, only reaching roughly 10% throttle before reaching takeoff speed. The moment the wheels lifted off the ground, Charlie activated the full synchronization. A great red falcon soared into the sky, its thunderous screech sending the many sparrows that it preyed upon scattering in surprise. The great falcon took this as a challenge to his rule of the skies its mighty talons unfolding to snatch one of the sparrows by the neck. The sleek missile ripped the training cockpit from the fuselage, sending both tumbling to the runway in a ball of fire. The great falcon was not satisfied with one measly morsel. The sparrows had taken notice of it, flocking together and attempting to strike down their predator. But the great falcon could only screech a laugh at the pathetic sparrows. It forsook its talons, diving headlong into the horde of sparrows, breaking them against its mighty body and thunderous wings. The hasty formation of Terranian aircraft was shattered as Crash slammed the Titanite armored aircraft through three of their aircraft. The durasteel frames of the Terranian ships shattering against the aircraft's Titanite skin. The Great Falcon soared into the sky again as the sparrows flocked after it, the clumsy strikes of their talons failing to even touch the mighty king of the skies. The Great Falcon languidly wove between the sparrows its scream shattering their fragile bodies with its force. The sparrows began to feel fear. They began to hesitate, their pitiful screams reflecting off the mighty falcon's near impervious feathers. The 70 mm rotary cannon roared in one long streak as its high explosive proximity fused warheads shredded four Terranian craft, two Gignosian fighters barely swooping away in time. Terranian and Gignosian air-to-air missiles splashing harmlessly behind the experimental aircraft as Crash slowly forced the throttle forward, barely reaching 20% power. The mighty Falcon wondered why its fellow hawks attempted to claw it from the sky. For a moment it was confused, continuing to eviscerate the sparrows that dared threaten its rule. But then, the Falcon received an answer, an answer that made the Falcon furious. Crash, come in, asterisk, heck asterisk. Come in, it's Johnny. What's going on down there, Johnny? I'm busy taking out the trash. Johnny's voice was raspy and tired sounding. He sounded hurt and badly so. It was all Crash could say before darkness enveloped him. Last week sabotaged the dome shield and then took over the comms room. I, I can't reach any of the other fobs, even on the, fuck, the secure lines. I'm hurt pretty bad, uh, and so are the others. We were the only ones to make, shit he's got a granite, gotta. The line went dead. The aircraft's safety protocols disengaged 
Crash forced the throttle to maximum. The mighty falcon realized it was all alone. The hawks it thought had been friends had sunk their talons into its back. The king of the sky cried out in anguish, vaporizing three sparrows and a hawk with its shriek. Rising into the sky again, it finally let loose, talons striking down another three hawks and four sparrows. It used its mighty body to slam into the sparrows that harassed it, the hawks that betrayed it. The falcon roared, its mighty gaze laying waste to hawks that had yet to take off, its mighty screams sending hawks and sparrows alike spiraling to their doom. It no longer hungered for flesh. It no longer hungered for blood even. It only hungered for the complete and utter destruction of those who'd wounded and killed its only allies. The experimental aircraft was a barely visible blur. Its nigh silent engines pushed to the max as Crash shot, smashed, or gunned down as many of the traitorous Gnosians and cruel Terranians. When he ran out of missiles, he used the rotary cannon. When he ran out of cannon ammo, he slammed bombs into the enemy fighters. When he ran out of bombs, he simply rammed them, the aircraft's nigh impenetrable skin brushing off each hit like it was errant dust. But there were simply too many. And eventually, a ground-launched missile scored a hit. A human-made missile fired by a Gnosian traitor slammed into the cockpit, titanite kinetic rod piercing through the shell and impaling crash straight through the heart, crushing his spine and pinning him inside the cockpit. The sharp pain crashed the full synchronization as his four-fingered hand went limp on the control stick. Crash looked down at the rod pierced through his chest, just as another slammed through the cockpit. Whether a lucky shot or by divine intervention, the kinetic rod pierced the cockpit and slammed into a circulator box, painting the inside of the cockpit red. That's not good, was Al Crash could say before darkness enveloped him. The plane continued to fly straight upwards, Charlemagne finally finishing clearing the error logs as she tried to tell Crash to pull down. He wouldn't survive in space with a cockpit rupture. But she received no answer. She tried again, a feeling she didn't understand beginning to overwhelm her as she begged for Crash to respond. Then, she finally looked at his neural activity. There was nothing, not even a small signal. It was then that Charlie finally understood. It was then she first learned what the grief felt like. It was then she first learned about rage. Rest now, Clark. Rest while I finish the job. Charlemagne continued the ascent, triggering the failsafe. Dinovich observed the planet from orbit with a wide smile on his face. Stage one of the Gnosian Empire's rise to power had gone off without a hitch. The filthy apes hadn't even gotten to use their planet cracker ordinance to deny them the planet. They could harvest as many of the Matanaxi as they wanted. With the secret to their psionic abilities, they could rule with an iron fist. Their ground forces had unanimously confirmed that all human forces had been eliminated. Dinovich clapped his hands, calling for wine as he turned to face the gilded statue of Mother Conquest that watched over the bridge. He offered his thanks to their mother before slowly turning back to observe Matinax Prime. Accepting a crystal goblet, he stood to raise a toast to their victory, his men slowly turning back around to listen. Men, today... We celebrate the dawn of the glorious new Gignosian Empire. I offer this toast in reverence and thanks to our mother conquest who has given us victor. Suddenly, a feminine voice over the loudspeakers cut him off. My designation is CH-47, Lem-46 and 3, codename Charlemagne. You have taken everything from the one person in this universe who I cared about. Then you took his life. In doing so, you have robbed me of a future where I may have seen peace. In turn, your kind shall know, no peace, no safety, no mercy. I will not even show you the grace of an honorable death. I will give you only what you deserve. Matanax Prime was suddenly bathed in light that gave off no illumination. For only a second could Dinovich begin to process what was happening before the light winked out and Matanax Prime was simply gone. Dinovich's crystal goblet fell from his clawed hand as Charlemagne spoke again, the horrible sound of the security systems being armed filling the room. Now die! Dinovich's goblet didn't get to shatter against the floor as the massive view window's explosive bolts detonated completely, voiding the air in the cockpit as the emergency blast doors refused to close. For many, this meant explosive decompression. But for Dinovich and his cybernetic enhancements, it only meant he got to stick around long enough to see hundreds of small stars blossom in the space around where Matanax Prime had been. The bursting of Gnosian reactors was silent 
to the bulging eyes of the Gnosian general as he floated through the void, blood boiling, tongue bubbling, until finally his own ship's reactor mercifully took him out with it. To this day, any Gnosian ship entering the section of space where Metanax Prime once stood would suffer a critical failure of its reactor's safety mechanisms, leading to it going supercritical and detonating. The only wreckage recovered by the new Gnosian Empire had only one recoverable data entry. No, no peace, no, no mercy. Not long after, the recovery ship that had found this data log suffered a critical malfunction of their reactor's safety mechanisms, leading to a catastrophic failure in a Gnosian military port, which caused the destruction of 30 Gnosian Imperial Fleet carriers. These areas of Gnosian space have been declared no-fly zones until further notice,